This episode is brought to you by Ursa Minor Outfitters. Folks, I'm absolutely in love with my Loon mug. It's handmade. It's an absolute piece of art. Whether it's at the office or at the house, people keep asking to check it out. If you're not a Loon fan, they also have other beautiful mugs for wildlife fans of moose, bears, and eagles. They specialize in products highlighting the outdoors and local pride through quality design by local artists. They've even started expanding into items beyond mugs, like apparel, dog accessories, and soon candles and more. They also try to partner and highlight other small businesses, and in some cases, forgo profits in lieu of charitable giving to help their community, such as the dog rescue. So check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for our four-legged hiking partners, they also have a portable silicone dog bowl and also a sweet over-the-collar dog bandana. Go check them out, ursaminoroutfitters.com, and don't forget to enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. Welcome everyone to the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm your host, Ivan, and together we'll embark on a weekly journey connecting with extraordinary hikers from all corners of the U.S. and beyond. Throughout these spring months, we've had the privilege of conversing with remarkable individuals. Their experiences and adventures will leave you yearning to hit the trails. In this week's episode, we're heading down to the Bay Area in California to talk to Scott about his local trail systems. You can follow Scott on Instagram at South Bay Hikes. Scott shares with us some of his favorite trails in and around the Bay Area, including some of the great local parks and preserves that are not only known for their spring wildflowers, but on occasion contain some snowy summits. He also shares with us some of his experiences hiking Half Dome in Yosemite and trekking through Pinnacles National Park. Without further ado, let's jump into this episode with our guest, Scott. Welcome, everyone, to the latest episode of the Hikes and Mikes podcast. I'm really excited to travel back to the Bay Area and speak with Scott, who's been exploring not just in and around the Bay, but around Central California. Scott, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. For folks that haven't had a chance to follow your adventures online, can you share a little bit about yourself and how you got started hiking? Sure. So I'm a California Bay Area native, so born and raised in San Jose, still live in in San Jose today. So I've got a lot of experience with these particular trails. I started hiking as a kid, really. I was in the Boy Scouts growing up, so did a lot of hiking there. But then really, I'd say maybe 10 years ago, we kind of wanted to get our kids into the outdoors. And so did some small hikes with them for a while, just the family. And then during COVID, I really started getting out solo, trying to do some bigger, tougher stuff to kind of just be able to exercise still and and kind of make online friends or, or whatever it was so that I could, yeah, still be active and, and still kind of get in touch with nature again. And, you know, we were talking about it, but I feel like the Bay Area has some of the most diverse hiking trails in California because like when I think of the Bay, I think of these lush green rolling hills, but you also have the coast. You also have some really lush forest. How would you describe the hiking and trail scene in and around your neck of the woods? Yeah, I totally agree. Like you say, it's really diverse. It's totally true. We do have kind of green rolling hills, maybe two or three months out of the year if we're lucky with with rain, but that time is right now. So in, you know, spring, it's looking really beautiful. I've got some favorite trails, you know, in the kind of Diablo range. Sierra Vista is, is a great place. I like to take my family, but we also have stuff you know, and again, like you said, over on the coast by the ocean, we've got redwood forests all around us. We've got kind of oak forests, all, all kinds of stuff. What I really liked about your feed is you're showcasing a lot of the hikes that are within an hour of the bay. Do you have any favorite trails that kind of fit within that hour drive? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's kind of the nice thing about, you know, where I am. A lot of the bay is about an hour away from something else in the bay. But like I said, kind of that Sierra Vista range, I like to stay if I can in places that are a little less crowded. I like to get out in nature to kind of be just by myself as much as I can and not be surrounded by people. And so another great place I like is called Grant Park, kind of also in that range where it's kind of up high enough into the hills, about an hour drive out of the city that nobody really goes up there. It's kind of a lesser known or lesser visited park. I can go out there and maybe see one person over the course of 10 miles or something. That's really nice. And then on the other side, you know, a famous place we have 
nearby is called Castle Rock State Park, famous for rock formations and, you know, pretty trees and stuff. But that place gets pretty crowded, whereas right across the street, there's this place called Long Ridge, which sounds like the most boring place you could imagine. Like the name Long Ridge, like, okay, what's there? Just kind of a, a nothing. But I, I went and checked it out and it's just as beautiful as, as Castle Rock State Park, but with maybe one-tenth the visitors, you know, so I can go out there and, and really be immersed in kind of these beautiful madrones and moss-covered rocks and, and oak trees and stuff and just kind of be by myself rather than constantly, you know, passing by other people and, and stuff like that. You know, from your feed, a lot of the pictures that you take on the trail, there's there's hardly anybody on the trails with you. You kind of do get to enjoy some of these hikes without the crowds that some of maybe California's national parks are known for. Yeah. Um, you know, Scott, one thing that really stood out to me is I've known not just the Bay Area, but the coast itself for not getting much snow. It has to be like a freak winter session to get a little bit of snowfall on the coast. But you've actually got out and found snow on some of these summits. How did that kind of come about and how far did you have to drive in order to reach that snow? So last year, 2023, we had kind of a cold winter, I guess. It just the conditions were right. Whereas normally we don't get a lot of snow on these mountains right around the Bay Area. For whatever reason, last year we did and it got pretty low. So I tried to take advantage of it as much as I could and hit three different summits that, you know, I regularly go to. They're still you know, within an hour of, of San Jose, which was Mount Diablo, Mount Umanum, which is local, and a mountain called Black Mountain, all three of which, you know, will get snow, I don't know, maybe every 10 years or, or less on, on some of them. But it was really cool to get out there and, you know, we're not equipped for snow around here. So a lot of the roads close, you know, the, nobody knows how to drive in the snow in the Bay Area. And nobody has chains or whatever. I don't even know what goes into snow driving, really, because I'm a San Jose native. But, you know, some of these parks are down low enough where you can start them, you know, just fine. But about halfway up the mountain, it suddenly is covered in snow. And, you know, I'm trudging kind of miles up in the snow where I'm I'm not used to snow. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just out there in my normal tennis shoes, got just a, a flannel on or something because I don't even own snow gear. I'm not a big snowboarder or anything. But yeah, just out there kind of slipping all over the place picking my feet up because it's it was pretty deep i'd say you know eight inches of snow or something and so kind of stomping my way through these big snow drifts to get to the top of these places and then at the top it's just you know magical to be in this kind of quiet snow and once again not too many people were out there doing these snowy hikes because they're all not used to the snow either so i had the whole place to myself and it was gorgeous and Scott, you know, we talked about these lush, beautiful green rolling hills. Like you said, you know, they only look like that a few months out of the year. But right now they're exploding with color because of the wildflowers that are coming to bloom. How would you describe your guys' spring wildflower season? And do you have any memorable hikes that you like to go on during the spring months? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, California golden poppies got to be my favorite flower. I love seeing them on the trail anytime I can get out during the spring. But there's tons of different kinds of wildflowers we have in the area. And we're just kind of starting to get into that right now here. Things are just starting to poke up right now. And I think, you know, last year I went on a hike and we tried counting the various you know, species of wildflowers. And we got, you know, over 30 or something. There's just so many around. Yeah, some of my favorite trails are Russian Ridge, which is by mid Pen in the area. Another one is Mayan Coyote Ridge by the Open Space Authority. They're on opposite sides of the valley, one kind of in the Santa Cruz mountain range, one in the Diablo range, but both just have great various types of, of flowers and they're just full of life this time of year. And I know that each wildflower season varies when it's, you know, going to reach its peak. It all depends on the temperature, the weather. Have you been able to kind of find like a specific month where if people were visiting, it would be a good time to hit the trails and try to see these wildflowers? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it does seem like it differs every year. I would say usually in the Bay Area, it's more early April is probably the, the best time to come to your best chances. But, you know, Sometimes I, I don't even know and I'm out there every week and then all of a sudden I kind of see like, oh, look, it's it's happening. So I, you know, I follow people that are out on the trails as well. And sometimes it's just it's there for one second and, and not there the next week. And you just kind of got to be there. But I'd say early April is probably the your best chances. You know, being located next to the Pacific, it provides you guys some great access to some coastal hikes with some amazing views. Do you have any favorite coastal hikes? Great question. I've got two that come to mind. One is it 
Wilder Ranch State Park, which is uh, near Santa Cruz. And you kind of hike out, walk along kind of these cliff tops, and then it kind of cuts in to a small little cove called Fern Grotto. And so you kind of go into this little cove. It's about 50 yards wide to this nice sandy beach. But if you kind of go back behind under the rock, there's this cave that goes back in and the whole ceiling is just covered in ferns and it's kind of dripping little drips of water and it's just like really magical down there with all these ferns and, and water and the ocean right there. It's a really cool spot. The other I'd probably have to say is Alamir Falls in Point Reyes. It's just gorgeous views. You're kind of up on the on the mountains overlooking the Pacific Ocean for miles and miles and then you get to this spot where there's a, a coastal waterfall that goes right down onto the beach. You know, it's big with all these kind of almost an oasis on, on top of it of plants plants growing and tiny little waterfalls and pools up there that you kind of soak your feet in. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous spot. Yeah. And I think you've shared both of those on your feet. I remember the Fern Grotto with the trickling, like almost like a mini waterfall coming down that you were able to record. You know, the, the one place that has really come onto my radar in California, especially over the last year, is Point Reyes. Everyone that I've talked to that's visited said it is just an absolutely stunning place to visit. So many different types of trails, a lot of wildlife. What's been your experiences visiting Point Reyes? Yeah, Point Reyes, to be honest, it's a place I haven't been to a ton. Done the Alamir Falls hike there, but it's a place I need to go more. It's kind of more North Bay. It's a bit outside my hour radius that I try to keep to. So I don't have a ton of experience, but it's a place I'd love to explore more. Yeah, same here. A lot of people just have mentioned how um, stunning that place is and it's so diverse within itself. You know, one thing that we like to do on the podcast is do a deep dive into our guest's Instagram and ask them about a post, maybe a location that captured our attention. And one common theme that I would come across on your feed, Scott, is that you would come across not just some unique ruins, but some unique buildings on the trails. Are there any structures on some of the hikes that you've done that kind of stand out for you that you can share with us? Yeah, great question. Structures on hikes. It's so interesting because I, I enjoy, you know, not only the natural history of an area, but just the human history as well. It's interesting to see how people use the land in other times, you know, separate from the 21st century or, or even the 20th century. One that comes to mind is a place I mentioned earlier, Mount Amanum. It's a local kind of peak that we have in the Santa Cruz Mountains that used to have an Air Force base on top of it. And it still has this big like five-story building up on top of the mountain here where you can kind of see it anytime you're you're in the South Bay. You can look over and see this mountain with a big just kind of rectangle on top of it. So everybody kind of knows where that is. And they just opened that within the last 10 years for sure up to hiking. So it's been really cool to be able to go up there. Another one that comes to mind is Fall Creek. I used to have some logging, redwood logging facilities there, which you know, breaks my heart to think about all these old growth redwoods being chopped down, but it is still at the same time cool to see the industrious ways they, you know, used the land and the lime kilns they had or just the buildings they had where they lived. All that stuff is really cool to me. And Scott, is that the one where like nature has basically started to overtake the ruins where they're kind of blending in with the surrounding area? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. You know, it's totally overgrown now. You know, it's, it's all made out of stone. It's got these kind of stone arch ways that they would, yeah, I think they're old furnaces, basically, they would kind of put stuff in there, but it's all covered in ivy and leaves and everything. It's, you almost wouldn't even notice it if you didn't know it was there, but, you know, it's a shortish hike up there, just a few miles, but it's, you know, gorgeous the whole way through these redwood forests. And then, yeah, just these old ruins are cool to kind of walk around and explore and, and think of what life was was like back in the you know late 1800s yeah for sure I, I love coming across old ruins or old structures that you know like you said were from the late 1800s early 1900s now switching gears i couldn't not ask you about your visits to some of california's amazing national parks you've been to a few i really want to get your experience at pinnacles because pinnacles just fascinates me i feel like it's an underrated national park but you also made it out to yosemite which is you know world renowned how many of the national parks have you been able to cross off the list there in california and have you had any memorable experiences that you can share with us 
Yeah, I'd say I think those are my only two, which is almost embarrassing to admit. But, you know, I'm in California with all these national parks around me, but there's not a ton super close to the Bay Area. So Pinnacles and Yosemite, I think, are our closest. But we have a few others that are beautiful that I'd love to get to someday. And I have plans in the works to get there. But Pinnacles is is our closest one. It's just a couple hours away from us in the Bay Area. And it's strange because it's almost otherworldly. It's You drive there and it just looks like you're in the middle of the most boring landscape you can imagine, just kind of, you know, shrub brush everywhere, kind of these rolling, boring hills of just dirt. And then you kind of come around a corner and it's just these huge rock formations, you know, out of nowhere. And it's just really cool to go in and explore. There's a couple different, you know, cave sections you can hike through. This last spring, they got a ton of rain. And so we were going through what's called the Balconies Caves. And it was basically under, you know, a couple feet of water the whole way. So you're, you got water up to your knees. You're going through these almost slot canyons. You felt like you're in, you know, Arizona or something, but it's just, you know, in your backyard here in California. So that was really cool. And then Yosemite is, of course, it's just Yosemite. There's, there's not much you can compare Yosemite to. When you're in the Yosemite Valley, you look up and it's got these big cliffs all around you, this huge amount of rock with waterfalls. It's just one of the prettiest places on the planet, I think. And it's such a, a joy and a privilege to be able to, to visit there. Yeah. And from your feed, Scott, you've done a hike that's on a lot of people's bucket list hikes there in Yosemite, and that's Half Dome. How was your experience doing that hike? Half Dome was an experience for me, for sure. I'd been trying to, you know, get through the lottery for a while for the Half Dome hike. And then conditions presented themselves where I was I was finally able to get three passes, one for myself and two for my teenage sons. And so we went up and did it. The problem was, and the reason I think why we got tickets so easily was that was the weekend that there was a hurricane in the Pacific Ocean, which never happens. But they were expecting a little bit more rain than normal in Yosemite that weekend. But I took the forecast and it looked like it was going to be sunny. And so I you know, tried to get tickets in and we got them. And so it was pretty smooth sailing. You know, it's a really tough hike. You know, I think it's about eight miles and it's pretty much uphill the whole way. You know, you're walking up rock stairs up these, you know, gorgeous waterfalls, Vernal Fall and Nevada Falls. And so the, the sights are beautiful the whole way, but you're just exhausted uh, almost from the start. And it's pretty steep right from the beginning and you've got still miles to go. And then by the time we got to the top or near, the clouds had started to come in, but we figured we're still okay. There they they wasn't too bad, but, you know, we go up onto the cables and, and we're fine. We get up to the top. And just at that point, everything had kind of become fogged in. And so we get, finally get up to the top of this, you know, world famous view and we've got no view at all. It's all just cloud. So we put a lot of work in to get there and, and it really didn't quite have the payoff we were looking for, but it was okay. It was still really cool, a cool experience. The problem was after we'd been on top about five minutes, it started sprinkling. And if you do any research about the dangers of Half Dome. You know, a lot of people think it's a it's a dangerous hike because there have been people that have kind of fallen off Half Dome. And most of those are happen on the cables. And most of those, I think all of those happen when it's raining. So we're thinking, oh, it's sprinkling. We better get down now before it gets any worse. But by the time we got back to the cables to go down, the rock was already slippery, oh, more man. slippery than I, I could imagine. And you know, two of us out of a group of three kind of slipped on the rock and had to hang on to the cables to make sure we didn't slide down. And just everybody had to wait it out. Everybody's on the cables there just stopped in place. You know, they have these two by fours that hold the, they're connected to the poles that hold the cables up. And so everybody's kind of standing on one of these two by fours to have some kind of grip. But if you try to take one step off of those, there's no traction at all. It wasn't even raining hard. You know, it was a pretty light drizzle, but it was just incredibly slippery with the steepness of that trail. So luckily we knew it was a, a pretty short, going to be a short kind of rain session. The rain lasted maybe half an hour and then the sun came out and dried everything in about another half hour. So we were kind of stranded on the cables there for about an hour before we could really move back down. Once we got to the bottom of the cables onto flat ground, we were all pretty relieved. But then we still had an eight mile hike back down. (laughs) So. Oh man, what an adventure. Yeah. I've heard from folks that even when it's dry because of the amount of traffic, 
that the trail gets on Half Dome, that the descent can sometimes be slippery if you don't have enough good traction on your shoes. So I can't imagine adding, you know, water and yeah, it just becomes a giant slip and slide at that point. Yeah, it was it was wild. It was pretty slippery. Some people were too scared to kind of stay up there. They were trying to slide down, you know, on their butts to get to the bottom. And that just seemed, you know, really dangerous to me. So we we stayed in place, tried to play it safe as much as we could because, you know, we, we thought we were in a, in a safe enough spot. And luckily, we were able to kind of ride that out. And Scott, that wasn't your first time doing Half Dome. You got a chance to do it as a teenager, right? Yeah, I did. So it was kind of nice. I did it when I was 13, maybe 14, you know, with my Boy Scout troop had had gone up there, got up there with, with my dad, actually. And we did that. To me, it's so funny, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really know what goes into all these things of permits and and all that stuff. And the permit system was a lot different back then. I don't think they had a a lottery back then yet. But yeah, it was it was cool to be able to go back there again and and kind of see it through different eyes. You know, I remember as a teenager kind of looking over the edge and doing all kinds of things I would never do today. But yeah, it was cool experience anytime you go, I think. Yeah. And to share it with your sons just added another level to it. That's really great. Now, Scott, one play in California that I feel hasn't been mentioned at all on the podcast. And for me, I had a friend who uh, moved up to the Oregon coast when I lived on the Oregon coast and they were originally from Big Sur and they just, the way that they described it and the pictures and videos that I've seen, it's just a magical looking place. And you got a chance to explore a little bit of Big Sur. How would you describe it to listeners? And what are some highlights that you would suggest people to add to their itinerary next time they're visiting that area? Big Sur is, yeah, a magical place. It's another place I need, I wish I could explore more. You've got gorgeous coastal views of the ocean. It's got this iconic bridge as you come into it called the Bixby Bridge. You know, I recommend everybody, you know, make a little pit stop there and, and take pictures just because it's it's such a cool place. What we did, we went down to a little place called Partington Cove, which was a, a short enough trail. You know, it wasn't too taxing or anything. My kids were all able to do it, you know, just fine. But it kind of follows a, a creek through this kind of small redwood grove and kind of you go through a even a tunnel through the rock and come out onto this these kind of cove of gorgeous, you know, crystal clear blue water, you know, rocks and just this beautiful scenery where it's, yeah, it's just, it's a really pretty place. And there's little spots like that all up and down the coast there. Lots of beaches you can explore, a lighthouse you can explore. Yeah, really, really cool, interesting spot. And Scott, how far away is that from, say, San Francisco? I'd say it's probably about a two-hour drive from San Francisco. Oh, so that's not too bad. Yeah, not not too bad. You can definitely, it's a great day trip or an overnight. You know, they've got hotels and stuff and and great restaurants that you can can visit there. It was funny, though. We went on a, I think on a Monday that the kids were out of school and... All the restaurants closed at like four o'clock or something. And we usually, you know, we wanted to be there kind of for sunset. So we we went and and did some sunset hike down and and came back up and we're looking for dinner and everything was closed. We except a little deli. So we got a little deli, some deli sandwiches and stuff. But yeah, it's still a great trip. I recommend it to, to anyone. Yeah. Now, Scott, in 2021, you did an epic hike that you dubbed the Grant Mega Loop, a 23.7 <laughs> mile loop around Grant County Park. And from, you know, your research, you hadn't really heard that it was a, a known thing that people were doing. How did the idea of doing this big loop kind of come about? And can you share a little bit about your experience that day completing those 23 Point seven miles. Sure. I'm a bit of a map geek. I love just kind of looking at, at the maps of various parks in the area and, and just kind of seeing what's on there. And I like to, one of the fun parts about hiking for me is kind of finding the trail I want to go on. So I don't often take you know, things from all trails or something of like, hey, everybody try this, you know, pre-planned kind of hike and do these trails in this trail. But I like to just kind of look at a map and see what can I do in this park? You know, where can I, you know, make it fit for me, the mileage I want to do. And, you know, Grant is one of my favorite parks. Like I said earlier, it's it's a place that's not visited a ton. So I can go out there and not see too many people. But it's also one of the bigger parks in the area. And I realized that you could make a loop out of the entire perimeter 
perimeter of this park and it would be doable in in a day if you really put your mind to it but train for it and so i figured out it's going to be you know a little over 20 miles and yeah i just made a day of it you know it's kind of circling this big park that that's one of my favorite parks and it was exhausting. I had never done, you know, more than 20 miles in a day before. I have a few more times now, but that was my first one. And so yeah, it was a great, you know, feeling of accomplishment to get out and be this steep hills in this park that really kind of taxed my body. By the end of it, I was, you know, kind of just waddling more than hiking, but great experience, something I, I'm proud of accomplishing. And Scott, do you remember how long it took you to complete the loop? Oh, man, that's I think it took me probably probably nine or 10 hours, something, something like that. Oh, wow. So is it like sunrise to sunset kind of deal or d- did you? Yeah, get... yeah, I think I think I even did it kind of in the winter. It, you know, the park gets a little hot in the summer, so I wanted to do it before it got too hot in the year. So, yeah, it was. It, I started pretty early and then. Yeah, I think I by the time I finished up, it was it was getting dark. Now, Scott, these next couple of questions are questions that we ask all our guests. When it comes to your day hikes, you know, for a lot of hikers, they have regular routines, regular summit routines or end of the hike routines. For some, it's just carrying their favorite snack or beverage. For others, it's a moment of zen. And then for a few of us, it's that favorite meal afterwards. Is there a regular custom or routine that you do when you reach your summit or maybe when you make it back out? I'd say the only the only thing I'd say is I, I try to have a small bag of candy with me just so I can look forward to eating something good when I get to the top and, you know, usually get at the bottom. So that's usually for me going to be like Sour Patch Watermelon. I feel like it's a perfect candy to keep in my backpack to just give me a little boost whenever I want it. And uh, kind of celebrate, you know, anytime I accomplish something with a little break and uh, a nice little bite of candy. I like it. (laughs) Now, when it comes to your pack list, Scott, outside of the essentials that you pack on a regular basis, is there any luxury items that you frequently pack that kind of fall outside of the essentials list? Luxury items. The closest thing, you know, that, that I can think of is I... I don't know if you call this a luxury item, but I always keep an extra pair of socks just because there's been too many times when my foot suddenly gets stuck in a big puddle of mud and my sock is covered and and I don't want to hike the rest of my, you know, 10 miles or something with a soggy, muddy foot. So I started keeping an extra pair of socks on my backpack and it's been really helpful. It's come in, in handy a number of times. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Scott. I always carry a second pair just because you just never know, like you said, if you step in mud or you accidentally step in a puddle. It's always nice to have that second pair just in case. Now, we're still at the very start of 2024. We're barely getting into the spring months. Do you have any hiking or travel goals for the rest of the year? Great question. You know, I, in a lot of ways, am am not a big planner. So I've got a a list of hikes that I want to do sometime on my phone, but I have no idea when I'm going to do them. And I almost just pull them out sometimes the the morning of, you know, I know I'll I'll go do a hike on a particular day, but I have no idea where I'm going to go until that day. And then I just kind of go off the vibes, I guess, and say, oh, you know, this one looks good on on my list or, oh, I saw this one recently. So I've I've got plans to to do hiking, but where those hikes are going to be, I have no idea right now. I like that style, Scott, because, you know, there's some some weekends where I'm like, I want to get outside, but I don't know which hike I want to do. And sometimes I'll catch myself on either all trails or on Washington Trails Association, you know, spending 30, 45 minutes trying to find a trail that that I could do. I kind of like that idea of just having a running list and just being able to pick at random, uh, depending on how you feel, which which hike you're going to do. I like that. Yeah. And that could depend on, you know, the weather a particular day. Do I want to shade? hike today, a sunny hike today, you know, it could just depend on, on my mood, you know, how long do I want to hike today? So, you know, I've got a, a list of, of hikes around me with, you know, how many miles it's going to be and, you know, places I haven't explored or old favorites or whatever it is. And yeah, just go wherever, wherever I feel like on a particular day. Right on. I like that. Well, that was it for the regular questions, Scott. This last section of the podcast is the this or that questions. I'm going to give you two hiking related terms and you just choose which one you prefer out of the two. But the first one is, do you prefer a steep incline or a steep decline? Oh, steep incline. Steep decline kills my knees for whatever reason. And depending on on the steeps, if it's, you know, really steep, you know, I, I feel like 
if I'm going down almost like a cliff or something, I'm kind of on my heels the whole time. I feel like I'm going to slip the whole time, but you know, going back up or up in the first place, I guess I'm on my toes. I've got my hands to kind of help me pull myself up. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll choose incline every time. And then this one's a tough one, but waterfalls or summits. Can I ask clarifying questions? Oh, definitely. Are there are there any secret caves behind the waterfall? I would say if if they do, yes. I would if, say yes. If it's got a if it's got a secret cave, then I'm going waterfall for sure. But if it's you know normal run of the mill water, waterfall, I'll, I'll I'll take a summit. There's, okay. there's something about being up high, seeing everything around you, kind of put your life to, into perspective. You've also got all these endorphins from hiking up some you know crazy you know steep trail that you know you've got this better sense of accomplishment. Yeah, I I think Summit all the way. And then this is a trail system question, but do you prefer a trail with switchbacks or would you prefer just straight up? Switchbacks, I I think, you know, especially if if it's trees, if there's trees all around, so you can't really see the other portions of the switchback. You know, love going uphill, but if if it's a gradual you know, incline rather than just a super steep one the whole time. I'll I'll, I'll take the switchbacks. And then do you use trek poles or do you prefer being freehand? I'm freehand. I've never used trek poles. It's something everybody recommends I should do someday. And I just have it for whatever reason. I don't know. Now, this next one is about your footwear. Do you prefer wearing hiking boots or have you made the switch to trail runners? I believe in hiking in whatever you've got. I've never been a hiking boot guy, I guess. So I guess trail runners are are more like what I wear, but honestly, I normally hike in just normal sneakers. (laughs) You know, I I think just hike in whatever you can. And if you get to a point where you feel like your footwear is is making it so you can't do the hikes you want to do, then maybe change at that point. But so far, I've gotten by just fine and you know just a a normal maybe cheap running shoe or or even a like a vans or something it's i'm okay with with whatever no yeah that's a good reminder for folks especially when they're starting now you don't have to have a hiking boot or a trail runner you know a lot of the sneakers people wear on a regular basis work just as good on most of the trails now uh, this next one's another trail system question scott do you prefer a loop trail or an out and back trail oh loop trail 100 percent. i can't imagine an out and back ever being better than a loop because it's just boring you you would see the same thing over again when you come back i'd much rather see different stuff you know the entire time and then when it comes to carrying your water for the hike do you use a traditional water bottle or do you have a hydration pack or camelback i used to be traditional water bottles. I used to carry, you know, two or three Nalgene's with me. Recently, you know, maybe a year ago, made the change to a, a Camelback, and I'd say it's far superior. It's so much easier, so much less hassle. You can drink, you know, smaller bits more often, and you know, probably not waste as much water, but still stay you know, more hydrated. I think it's better all around. And then these next two are our toughest ones, but sunset hikes or sunrise hikes. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I'm a night owl, so I go on more sunset hikes. I think they're amazing. But if I can ever motivate myself to actually get up for a sunrise hike, not only are they are they gorgeous in a different way, but my day is actually, you know, starting off on this incredible, you know, feeling of you know, starting off on this incredible, you know, feeling of, of you know, euphoria. Um, it's great all around, but um, sunrise probably is the better option, but sunset is what I do. <laughs> and how about spring wildflowers or fall colors? Oh, the Bay Area is generally horrible for fall colors. So spring wildflowers, there are no remarkable, you know, fall hikes really in the Bay Area, but there's plenty of great spring wildflower hikes. So I'll I'll go spring wildflowers. And then the last one is, do you prefer a long gradual hike or a short and steep hike? Yeah, long gradual. If I can, you know, climb up a mountain and, you know, get a, a little sweaty and a little out of breath, but still feel like I, you know, climbed up a mountain, that's great. If I get up to the top and like I'm falling over, it, it was so steep, then I mean, it's still, it's a great accomplishment, but not quite as fun. That was it for the this or that questions. For our listeners, if they want to follow along with your adventures on the trails, as well as you provide some really great trail details on your Instagram, where are some of the places on social media and online that they can follow you in your adventures? Yeah, just on Instagram at South Bay Hikes. That's where I'm at. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Scott. It was awesome talking to you and learning about the Bay Area and your experiences in and around your neck of the woods. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you. Really appreciate you having me. It was a great time. And that brings us to the end of this episode alongside Scott. We extend a heartfelt thanks to him for coming on the podcast. Make sure to stay connected and follow him on Instagram at South Bay Hikes. And don't forget to check out the episode show notes for more. We have an incredible lineup of episodes planned throughout the spring months, and we can't wait to share them with you. New episodes will be dropping every Monday with occasional bonus episodes on Fridays. To ensure you never miss out on those thrilling tales, remember to hit that like and subscribe button. Your support means the world to us. Don't forget to join our vibrant community on Instagram at Hikes and Mikes. We'll be sharing episode visuals, my own personal hiking content, and so much more. Let's stay connected and continue to inspire each other on this remarkable journey. As we bid farewell, remember to tread those happy trails, embrace the great outdoors, and keep the spirit of adventure alive. Until next time, my fellow explorers, happy hiking. This episode's music was created by Ketza. Follow him on Instagram at Ketza Music. This episode is brought to you by Flip Socks. Whether you're on the trail, on the job, or in the yard, Flip Socks will keep Mother Nature out of your boots with their innovative nylon sleeve. You no longer need to worry about any annoying debris getting trapped in your boots during your hikes. Simply flip down the nylon sleeve over any boot to prevent Mother Nature from finding its way inside, keeping your feet comfortable all day long. To get your first pair, visit FlipSocksWithAZ.com and enter promo code HIKESMIKES10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. And for listeners who use the promo code at checkout, I'll be donating 100% of the Season 2 promo code proceeds to Big City Mountaineers, who provide transformative experiences through connections to nature that strengthen life skills and build community for youth and disinvested communities across the nation. So if you're tired of bits and pieces of the trail finding its way into your hiking boots, pick up a pair of flip socks today with the promo code HIKESMIKES10 to get 10% off. For website and promo code, see the episode description.